News Talk, AM 760, everywhere on iHeartRadio and the iHeartRadio app at 760radio.com. Mark Larson here. Good to have you back with us every day from 10 to noon here. Happy and honored to have Dr. Harrison Jack Schmidt with us, Apollo 17 astronaut, among other things. Uh, I'm sure just thrilled beyond belief to be appearing with me as your friendly host and MC <laughs> on stage. Out of all the things you've done, Jack, I'm sure that was right up there with one of them. On your well, list. It, it certainly is delightful, that's for sure. Well, we had a great weekend. It was fun to, out of other things, kind of keep an eye on the Falcon 9 launch and get your commentary as that was going on on uh, Saturday night after the event. But first, before we talk about the Artemis uh, launch and the scrub today and, and the fact that here you are not only having tremendous experience, uh, history-making as a geologist, a pilot, astronaut, administrator, businessman, author, U.S. Senator, but in 1972, almost 50 years ago, there you were in the Valley of Torres Littro on the moon as the only scientist, geologist there, the last of 12 men to step on the moon during during Apollo. So uh, I want to get to that, but I also want to touch on just how great it was to be at that event because of the the scholars in the room, wasn't it? I mean, you were the keynote speaker, but having Christina Cook there, who may very well be the first woman to walk on the moon as you did, pretty mind-boggling, isn't it? Well, it was a great event. The Astronaut Scholarship Foundation is a group that has now grown and growing rapidly uh, through the years uh, to uh, assist uh, qualified students, highly qualified students, as you recognized, uh, at uh, getting the kind of education that future technological uh, advances in the free world are going to require. You know, in your keynote the other night, one of the things that struck me is where you talked about all the, the rocks that came back from the missions. It's something like, what, 800 pounds total, if I remember right, and a lot of those from Apollo 17. And uh, you mentioned how they were there was such foresight to essentially freeze them and expecting there would be future technological advances. And now here we are where they're starting to have all these new techniques to go back and really dig into the hows and whys and, and what else do we learn from some of the trailblazing things you did back in the day? Well, there's no uh, no question that uh, that uh, foresight by NASA advisors as well as NASA was extremely important because in 50 years, the, the kind of analytical technology that has developed in geochemistry and other fields uh, is just remarkable. And now after a couple of years of, uh, since the release of those samples by uh, NASA, uh, we have begun to see new things that we just wouldn't have been able to see at all uh, 50 years ago. Uh, for example, we can examine the core tubes and the rocks themselves using x-rays now, mm -hmm. uh, get inside, look inside these uh, samples and uh, be able to plan the uh, strategy for analysis much, much better than we could in the past. I know that when uh, Artemis is finally successful, and obviously they, they scrubbed it today, but that's not the first time things have been scrubbed for safety and make sure everything's absolutely right. But by Artemis three, if all goes well, in the next couple of years or so, uh, humans could be back on the moon, and it's a whole different way of doing things. The orbits are way different. Uh, they're going to a different part of the moon um, where they'll be doing a lot of geology again. What, they, what, they hope, what are we going to be finding? What do they hope to find there? Part of it involves frozen water, doesn't it? Well, once, uh, once we do indeed uh, land near the South Pole, uh, we have the opportunity almost certainly to uh, sample the, uh, the ice and other uh, solid volatiles that are there in these very, very cold traps. Uh, the, uh, the temperature of these uh, so-called permanently shadowed areas of the moon get down to uh, 40 degrees Kelvin. That's 40 degrees above absolute zero temperature. Mm. So it's a very, very different uh, environment for sampling, for operations. The lighting changes very rapidly. So there, there are a number of new challenges that the Artemis program will have to face. Uh, I just uh, published in Aviation Week an op-ed piece where I suggested that they might consider uh, that the first two or three Artemis human landings uh, be at uh, somewhat less challenging location. So oh. another generation of controllers, another generation of astronauts, managers, uh, you know, can get their feet wet in uh, slightly less challenging 
operations than are required for the South Pole of the Moon. Talking with Harrison Schmidt, who was uh, not only Dr. Schmidt, but uh, 12th man on the moon. There were 12. He's one of four still with us here and the only geologist uh, that, that scientist to uh, to be there with all this. And that's where all of this is going now. And obviously, there's also the gateway you know, to go back to the moon to get to beyond to Mars and whatever else uh, will be uh, doable, if you will, when uh, technology uh, allows. Uh, you write scientific papers. You're out on the university circuit a lot. I mean, you mentioned Aviation Week. I'm looking forward to that. As a subscriber, I'll, I'll eagerly uh, read that when it's, uh, when it's appearing. But... Uh, what are you seeing in terms of what this Artemis focus now and all of the other competitors, the ones working with NASA like SpaceX and Blue Origin, it, it does seem like it's tapping into some uh, to a new level of excitement, right? I don't know if it's the same kind of excitement when you're going up against the Russians, although the Chinese are out there now playing the part of the Russians in the space race. But, but what are you seeing in the campus settings and the scientific community when it comes to this, where we go now? Well, in the scientific community, they're looking forward very much to uh, not only sampling the uh, solid volatiles that we, we talked about previously, but also uh, a South Pole landing puts you in a position to sample material that has been thrown from the South Pole Aiken Basin on the far side of the moon. That basin is 2,500 kilometers in diameter, hmm. uh, is the probably the second largest basin on the moon. Uh, the first being uh, the focal arm basin on the near side. Uh, and uh, and we just uh, would be an opportunity to not only sample some materials uh, from the far side of the moon in, in great detail, but also to sample materials that have come from fairly deep within the moon. The, that basin, South Pole Aiken Basin, uh, is about 12 kilometers below the mean lunar radius. So it is, uh, it is an exciting uh, prospect. Uh, certainly, uh, ultimately, a far side landing almost certainly will go to that basin. Mm. The other, uh, the other aspect of the science, of course, is to uh, just broaden our perspective on uh, on the composition of the moon. Most people don't realize that when we study the moon, we're really studying the early history of the solar system, and uh, and indeed of the Earth itself. A, a period of extreme violence in a period in which uh, life began. So life began in the uh, violence of impacts on the Earth in the presence of water, which is the big contrast between the Earth and the Moon. Uh, otherwise, they're approximately the same composition. Uh, but the uh, presence of water on Earth almost certainly uh, was uh, responsible for the, the organization of complex organic molecules and ultimately the origin of life. Mm -hmm. I'm talking with Dr. Harrison Schmidt, who happens to be the lunar module pilot on America's most, I always like to say not the last, but the most recent uh, mission to the moon on Apollo 17. Um, when you hear some of the same calls now, it always boils down to budgets and what they do in D.C., and you had the uh, the extra pleasure, I'm sure, of uh, serving in the U.S. Senate to see how the uh, the budgeting works in the belly of the beast. But there's always that debate, and I've already seen over this last weekend, even before the attempted, uh, the first attempted launch of Artemis this morning, some people saying, well, maybe we should spend more money here on Earth. It's like, well, that shows real ignorance, doesn't it? Your thoughts on that? Because it's always about the money, isn't it? Well, it is about the money, but it's also about the historical perspective hmm. and the future perspective of our leadership. And I'm afraid that we still have not fully admitted to ourselves the kind of challenge that China represents. It is, is is at least equal to that of the former Soviet Union and maybe even greater because of their very, very strong commitment to uh, to communism, which, uh, mm. again, is something that uh, I don't think this country will survive uh, if uh, they tend to dominate deep space. They have made it very clear publicly that they intend to try to dominate not only uh, near Earth space eventually, but the, the moon itself. And they're quite interested in the resources of the moon, uh, particularly one that you can bring back to Earth and fuel fusion power plants. Yeah, and there's a lot of that up there, potentially, anyway. But, uh, but, I remember back in the day as a young kid, uh, there was a talk about, oh, look what the Soviet Union's doing and the moon's going to be red. And you know, that really hasn't changed. And uh, like you say, if anything, the, uh, the motivation from China's government right now is beyond that because they don't... You know, we don't know how many how many scrubbed anything that they have. They don't exactly do bulletins sometimes, but 
Intel can show that uh, show that as well. Um, well, you can hope you can hope that the intelligence community is 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 wiser than I am. Of <laughs> well, the intent. I don't know about that. You're a pretty smart guy, Jack. So uh, yeah. I mean, I, I just feel smarter sitting next to you too, like these so these scholars, um, because it really is so so fascinating. And history makes a big big difference when it comes to this. Unfortunately, there's so much of a push now to um, you know be extra woke and erase some history and. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, some of the PR over the years, sometimes from NASA, has not exactly been, you know, when people say, well, we just went to the moon, and did we go more than once? Or, you know, what did we do in the space station? Didn't we take laundry back and forth? Or, you know, people just don't have a clear understanding. It's not being taught. Which brings me to a different question that's kind of related to this. Politically speaking, since you were a U.S. senator from New Mexico um, and Apollo 17 astronaut, so far, I know the, the jury's out on this, but is the Biden administration or the Trump administration better for what we're talking about here in terms of bold space? Let's, you know, learn what we need to learn and let's use it for uh, for the good. Well, I think you're just looking at the record that uh, the Trump administration made it very clear that they were uh, interested in pursuing the Artemis program very vigorously. And uh, the, I think the jury's still out on whether the the Biden administration is going to do that. We'll just have to see. And, of course, it depends on uh, convincing Congress not only to fund uh, what is requested uh, by NASA in order to do the technical job, but as we talked before, I think, Mark, uh, one thing that made Apollo so successful is that we that Jim Webb, the administrator of NASA in the Kennedy administration, uh, insisted that the, they that he have a management reserve of funding so mm. that difficulties like we see today with the rocket do not result in a long-term delay of schedule. Uh, and that's what management reserves do. They let you deal with the management risk that comes from doing very complex technological endeavors. I know you're, out, you're not out there like an engineer on the uh, launch pad right now, pad 39, uh, 39B. But they have a window uh, to launch if all things come together and they get the glitches fixed from today on uh, on Friday, then again on Monday. If it's something they can't fix on the pad, they got to take it back to the VAB, the big, uh, the giant assembly building. What's your hunch, knowing what you know? How do you think that plays out? I just don't know enough about the uh, the issue. All I hear, all I see, is what's been published and uh, some statements from NASA that uh, they're still evaluating. Uh, what their uh, basic issues are. Uh, if it has to go back into, if they have to take the the uh, SLS, the Space Launch System, back into the uh, Vehicle Assembly Building, then uh, you're going to see a delay of some weeks, I, I suspect. Yeah, it takes a long time to roll that thing back to the VAB as well. Uh, Jack Schmidt with us, Harrison Schmidt, Dr. Schmidt, who's Apollo 17 Lunar Module Pilot, and uh, as as vital as ever, uh, really making a difference in uh, science and exploration, and certainly your uh, geologist know-how on all fronts. What do you hope that uh, today's generation and those moving forward get from all of this? Well, I hope they realize that uh, a very broad uh, te technical, mathematical, and historical education is extraordinarily important to their future and to the country's future. Our education system has in fact, it generated over, um, for the large part over the last 50 years. Uh, the, the Apollo generation was uh, the beneficiary of great preparation as well as motivation, uh, preparation in a school system that generally looked mm -hmm. at teaching critical thinking, uh, at uh, knowledge of true knowledge of facts. And unfortunately, that has been changed and diluted by the current educational elite that uh, run the public education system and to some degree the private education system. Certainly the universities are not cooperating and not participating in the teaching of critical thinking and true knowledge. So uh, I, that's the biggest challenge for current generations is to repair that education system, uh, repair what they have learned, uh, continue to learn in as broad a spectrum of subjects uh, as they possibly can underpinned primarily by mathematics. Amen to all that. Dr. Harrison Schmidt, Apollo 17 astronaut, legend, inspirational as always. And I know if you were given a chance and all things added up, you'd, you'd go back again. Although you'd have to sell Teresa on that, see how that works out. Well, no, it's not, don't have to sell her. She, she has to go with me. Oh, well, problem <laughs> solved.
<laughs> All right, Jack. Thank you. Stay safe. Thanks, buddy. Take care, of Dr. Jack Schmidt, Harrison Schmidt. People hear Harrison. Is that Harrison Ford? No, this is look him up. Google him. San Diego's Talk, AM 760. Did you know that our iHeartRadio Music Festival is back September 23rd and 24th at T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas? Two nights, one stage. While the world is listening on iHeartRadio, you could be there. Free chances every weekday to win your trip for two plus a thousand bucks in spending money. All the info at iHeartRadio.com slash festival. 800 760 5362 is our number. Um, you, you excited about the uh, possibilities of where we're going in space next? Or are you saying, spend it on something here? Like, say, pay for my college. Is that what it is? 800-760-5362. 800-760-5362. Part, yeah, NASA's part of the problem. We alluded to this talking to astronaut Harrison Schmidt in the last segment from Apollo 17. Um, that the uh, the PR apparatus has not been through 135 space shuttle missions Often the word would be like, well, there goes the shuttle crew. They're heading back to the International Space Station. And one time they were taking the, was it the treadmill or some bit that Stephen Colbert, back when he was funny, uh, they uh, were setting up the uh, Stephen Colbert uh, treadmill. You know, like, oh, that's a big deal. They're going to go up and they're going to uh, change the oil and they're going to bring up a new window. And that was it. Every one of those missions, if you ever want to do something that will make you smarter automatically than most members of Congress, just start Googling the uh, shuttle missions, STS-1 all the way through 135. And, and again, we're talking about the Artemis uh, launch today, which was scrubbed, because part of the reason was they were stressed. That was mentioned by NASA earlier. They were pushed so hard to get it right, like every mission, but there's a whole new generation there now. They don't know what some of the earlier pioneers did and what they learned. They, they learned as much as they can from it. But when you're in it, 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 is, it is a crucible. It is a hot environment. Because if you hear these countdowns, and, and I've been to several launches over the years, sometimes when they get scrubbed. You know, one of the, some of the shuttle missions got scrubbed a lot. There was one, and I forget which number it was. Uh, but they were scrubbed, um, I think, five times. It's not a bad thing. You learn something from that and you fix it. Now the question is, can they launch on Friday? And I think the launch window on Friday is around 9 in the morning, something like that. And again, the plan is after this mission, which is without humans on board, but with three, you know, with the mannequins, they fit up to four in the, uh, in the Orion uh, capsule. They have a, like a thousand sensors to test the stress on these mannequins. It'll be everything but the actual human component. And then splashdown is supposed to happen here off the coast of San Diego after 40, 42 days, something like that. So uh, NASA is... That was uh, STS-127. 127 was the... Uh, scrubbed five times. Scrubbed five times. I think that's uh, Kristen Fisher, who uh, used to be at Fox, who's on CNN, who's like the space expert. She's really good. And her dad, medical doctor, was on that flight. That's how I remember that, somewhere back in my... In my brain cells. But uh, anyway, I, th I think it's well worth it. I, I mentioned this earlier to see the crowds that showed up on the Space Coast there at Kennedy Space Center and, and uh, Cape Canaveral, Port Canaveral, Melbourne, and see uh, where the future is going to spend some time with Christina Cook, who could be the first woman on the moon. She's an active astronaut now. Google her when you're at it. That's Cook, which is uh, K O C H. But. Um, this is what America does best, and they're making a big deal about it. Oh, this is international. It's not just about America because there's a component on the on Artemis that is the European something like behind the Orion capsule. But you got a lot of companies involved. It's a big deal for Boeing, um, but they've also had some some delays, and you never want to push a lot. Lesson, lesson is if they had did it, if they had, if they did it, if they had did it this morning. I mean, first of all, they were concerned about the weather. The weather opened up, and it was fine right about launch time, which was scheduled 5.33 our time. We were talking about this, covering this on a special YouTube video on San Diego Air and Space Museum YouTube. That should be posted there now. Check that out. Jim Kidrick, the CEO, and I were, were hosting this, and we had the legendary flight controllers Gene Kranz, you know, with the vest and the crew cut, Jerry Griffin, and Milt Windler. And they were talking about what they know, what they learned, what was going on all the way up to the scrub. And they'd been plenty of time stuff didn't happen. When they pushed it. Grab your loved ones and come choose your perfect, real, fresh-cut, fragrant Christmas tree at your neighborhood Armstrong Garden Centers. 
Explore a forest of the freshest real Christmas trees, all stood in water that you can see from all angles. Once you choose your perfect Christmas tree, the friendly employee owners at Armstrong will load it onto your car for you or deliver it right to your front door. Armstrong Garden Centers, helping you deck the halls and make your Christmas brighter. Mary redeemed a $50,000 cash prize playing Chumba Casino this year. I was only playing for fun, so winning this was a dream come true. Chumba Casino is America's number one social casino experience. It's serious fun. With over 80 casino-style games to choose from, you too could win life-changing amounts of cash. Be like Mary. Log on to ChumbaCasino.com and give them a whirl. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary, void, or prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. The voice in the preceding commercial was not the actual voice of a winner. It got ugly. While you're Googling, check out Apollo 1. That happened on the launch pad. They're doing what was supposedly a routine test, and then suddenly three of our best and brightest astronauts were dead on the launch pad, and on the test pad. 1967, then it looked like it was over. Then it wasn't. Then you're go, 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 and they're just doing a phenomenal amount of work going to the moon, landing successfully six times, and then all of a sudden, pushing into the space shuttle. And then the Challenger explosion. And then February 1st of, uh, what was it, 2003, Columbia breaks up with a technological failure over Texas. One of the most moving things that I, I go and see every time I'm at the Kennedy Space Center, and I was there to see this on Saturday, is a panel off of the Challenger, and then there's a the windshield from Columbia that were retrieved and um, they're in this very kind of a reverent display. It's really moving. And then there's a big tribute to all the astronauts who gave everything, sacrificed their lives. They didn't plan on doing it, but it's always a risk in any of these things. So you never want to push it. Just like when you're flying, you're flying airplanes. You never bleep with the weather, as my instructor and buddy Joe Graham said. Rule number one, never bleep with the weather. So as I'm flying back to Orlando and changing planes in Houston yesterday, I heard people on uh, Southwest by the way, Southwest is still a great airline. And you, you know, you're packed in there. It's a cattle call, but at least they have a sense of humor. Um, they, uh, you know, people saying, oh, come on, you're, you're inconvenienced. Well, you know, it would be very inconvenient as they launch into a thunderstorm. They did that with Apollo 12. NASA did. Seemed like a good idea. Got struck by lightning and lost power. And then they figured out a quick fix. That's what happens when you push it as opposed to saying, let's think this way. Let's think it through. Your thoughts, 800-760-5362, or you can press that red microphone button on the talkback button thing there, and you're listening live on the iHeartRadio app, San Diego's Talk, AM 760. One other thing on the whole uh, issue of things that you launch into space, in this case, the uh, giant Artemis rocket this morning, it, it boiled down to, again, the sequence was weather, don't bleep with the weather, you know, the lightning, and then uh, that clears out, and then all of a sudden there's the issue, of, there's a hydrogen leak, they fix that. There's, uh, there's no small undertaking. You got just hundreds of people working on this. And then there's, uh, well, what's this crack on the, on the main tank, the kind of orange tank that's the orange is the, it's a substance they put on there to keep everything chilled, keep it cold. And it's like a thermo insulating goop. Uh, but they thought they saw a crack in it. And of course that takes you back to some of the problems with, uh, with the shuttles. They get that done. They said, yeah, that's fine. So we, we go with that. And then all of a sudden they say, well, we got a problem with this engine, the fueling of an engine. So there are four engines on this. And they're the engines like you remember seeing on all those space shuttle missions. When you see them on the launch pad and they, they kind of, they move around and uh, as they're getting ready to go, those, those same engines. So they had some of those engines that were still left around. So they used those engines, put them on the big tank. That's essentially what there was with the same solid rocket booster. So it looks a lot like the shuttle on steroids. And they had some shuttle stuff. And so now there's a debate of, why are they using all that stuff? Well, you know, that's not unusual. But I guess there was also a test. I'm not sure if that was the problem or one of the earlier ones. I think it was one of the, the engine. Because the weather was so rough down there. And, and trust me, it was. I was at Kennedy on, on uh, Saturday, and the lightning was just ferocious. You know, this is going to be fun. These storms usually come through in Florida, and they're out in. Yeah, you know, if it rains in Florida, you gotta wait 10 minutes, it'll be gone. They just kept coming. It was heavy rain and then lots of lightning. So, uh, but the, because of all that, they apparently weren't able to do one of those tests. So some of that was like learning the hard way this morning, even with all the best preparation. So there will be a debate. Uh, 
why do you use some of the other stuff? Well, the whole idea, that's not unusual. It's kind of the thing now to reuse everything. You know, the rockets are coming back from SpaceX and NASA is moving in a lot of that direction as well, working with them and, and Blue Origin and so forth. So, but they'll get it done. The question is, will they do it on Friday? Will they do it on Monday? If not, or, or if they can't fix that engine issue on the launch pad, then they got to roll that back. With that crawler that goes so slowly, take about three days to get it all back in the garage, if you will. It's called the VAB, Vertical Assembly Building, or, or Vehicle Assembly Building, whatever you like. Um, that's where they built the Saturn Vs and assembled them and take them out there and get them all fueled up. And, you know, so they use the same historic launch pad. You do not want to launch into disaster. So... I'm, I'm all for scrubbing it. I'm just glad I wasn't there today. I just thought if I stay... Then they'll scrub it. So now that's blown that paradigm. And and Jack Schmidt was with us, the uh, Apollo 17, the uh, 12th man on the moon out of the 12 human beings who were there. And he was lunar module pilot back in December of 72. But he didn't stay for the launch either. Neither did flight director legend Jerry Griffin. Because Jerry didn't want to stay because the traffic was too bad. So, yeah, but he, he was with all those, all the Apollo launches. But you never want to rush it, never want to push it. If you're on an airline going someplace, you never want to say, I wish the pilot would just take off in this storm anyway. Not if you want to live, necessarily. Just something to think about. Meanwhile, the national networks, they're not sure what to do with all this because they covered it, and then they don't know what they're talking about part of the time. But the big obsession now is you had Lindsey Graham, the senator who is not one of my favorites. Yeah, he's Republican sometimes. But he said something on uh, one of the weekend talk shows, I guess he was on, on Fox, and he said there will be riots in the streets if Trump is prosecuted. Not exactly the best thing to say if you want to uh, keep calm. But at the same time, he said it. So you can say all kinds of crazy stuff if you're on the left. You can be, uh, who is it, Val, Val Demings from Florida. They have ads running, I saw in Florida on this, reminding of some of the greatest hits where she said it's a beautiful thing when the riots were going on after George Floyd back in uh, in 2000, COVID season one. She said, it's a beautiful thing. You know, we should admire these people. And Kamala Harris said, oh, there's, there's going to be more. And now it's like, oh, Lindsey Graham said something. There might be riots in the streets. See, they love that. Lindsey shouldn't have said that. Not sure which side he's on sometimes when it comes to this, but you know how that all works. So maybe maybe it's some sort of uh, strategy. So the networks will obsess on that. One thing that they haven't done, oh, and now they're saying uh, they're saying Trump is also calling for an uprising because he was on. Did you do this on social media on uh, Truth Social? Uh, Trump encourages FBI agents to go nuts and not take it anymore over Mar-a-Lago raid. The, the people because there are extremes in any organization every organization and then there's rational people going i can't stand what's going on here i've actually talked to some people within the fbi who don't like in recent years how things have been run and these are fine upstanding people so you got to be careful not to broad brush everybody but trump didn't use the uh, the word you know the r word but Let's see, here's Mediaite.com on this. Trump appeared to call for the rank, appeared to, sort of seemed to, call for the rank and file of the FBI to revolt. A lot of this is revolting, but um, thank you. A revolt against its leadership over the seizure of classified documents. And we had John Bolton on with us, former national security advisor to Trump, and he's no big Trump fan. But he said when he was on with us in the first hour today, that you can hear it on the podcast at 760radio.com. He said that the uh, that the opposition here, the uh, anti-Trump side, may overplay their hand for the third time. They had the two impeachments, and we. Don't, I don't think we're ever going to know what was in those documents. I think they get to a point where it just it, it continues to hang, so you can keep the narrative going. Like, remember, the FBI had to raid his house because national security. Can we see it? No, you can't see it. Let's run that footage again. Show the orange man. I'm not here to defend Trump, but I I want to defend truth. So they put out this affidavit on Friday. Do you see what Trump did, by the way, baiting him on social, uh, truth social? It was Friday or Saturday. He The post was something, I don't have it in front of me at the moment, but it said something like, they missed one. 
and they had a document that was all redacted with the heavy duty Sharpie lines. And then the only words that were revealed were make America great again. <laughs> he doesn't know how to stir the mm -mm. And the affidavit says things like, there's probable cause to believe the evidence of obstruction will be found. And now here's some of our evidence. Now you can't see it. It's a serious crime. If that's what it is. Hey, if this if it's there, then then prosecute them. But they're being really oh, it would jeopardize the investigation, would it? Or is it would it reveal how stupid and how political this is? We don't know. We're going to talk with a longtime political expert, controversial he, Dick Morris, about this time tomorrow, about all this. He says, hey, Trump's got this in the bag. He's coming back, no doubt about it. Right? I'm not sure that I agree with that. But Trump goes on uh, through social yesterday, his own personal ban from Twitter uh, version of social media. And uh, he, he said when the, uh, where's the quote here? When are the great agents and others in the FBI going to say, we aren't going to take it anymore? It's like Howard Beale in Network. I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. Much as they did with James Covey. Covey. James Comey read off a list of all the crooked Hillary Clinton crimes only to say no reasonable prosecutor would prosecute, Trump said. That's true. That happened. Yeah, it's only 33,000 emails. Nothing to see here. And then Trump continued in his posting yesterday, said the wonderful people of the FBI went absolutely nuts. So Comey had to backtrack and do a fake investigation, all caps, in order to keep them at bay. The end result, we won in 2016 and did much better in 2020. Well, it was the final result. But now the left has lost their minds. So that is now spun by the national media that Trump is, is trying to uh, have an uprising. You want people to go to the street. And then Lindsey Graham adds to it by going, well, if you prosecute them, there'd be riots in the streets. That's as bad as when you hear that from the left. Not responsible. But it would help if the American people had to more clarity on this, not less. But I don't think they want that. It's like January 6th. January 6th seems like that's really over, doesn't it? Unless that's what they're looking for, some smoking gun about January 6th. Well, they'll find a way to work it in so they can run the, uh, the footage again. Run the... The video of the guy climbing the front of the Capitol. Let's run that again. Don't show the uh, don't show the the guy who shot the woman from San Diego and that still has unanswered questions. Uh, 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 let's not even talk about that. San Diego's talk AM seven sixty. I mentioned earlier that iHeartRadio has launched the first of its kind, state of the art, always on entertainment space where music and gaming collide. It's like a uh, it's like a big bang. Theory thing. It's iHeartland. iHeartland available now in Fortnite. Experience concerts, events, and more for your favorite artists and podcasts. And you know, iHeart knows how to do this stuff for you, right? So figure it out. You just go and check it out online, iHeartRadio.com slash Fortnite. And of course the iHeartRadio Music Festival comes up next month in Las Vegas, September twenty third and twenty fourth. And we're giving away chances every day for you to win a trip for two plus a thousand bucks in spending money. Now that's that's better, much better than the MTV Awards last night which I happened to watch for a little bit, and then I could smell my brain cells going. <laughs> it apparently uh, ranked, sure did, uh, in, some, uh, in some areas as the uh, most crude so far because the thing is to just talk about controversial stuff. Nicki Minaj, who's a great talent, said uh, something, and I think it was on the departure of the show, have a great, uh, you know, suddenly she became a gynecologist what she said so there were things on that where everybody tried to get extra edgy and gross and make the political statements and all of that um comedian billy eichner you familiar with his work he's a guy who's hysterically funny uh during his segment um before announcing a performance by pop artist uh, panic at the disco which is a great uh, some of their music he's known for his show billy on the street took a moment to plug his new uh, LGBTQ rom-com movie, Bros. So he did that, as, as artists would normally do, by berating conservative justices on the, <laughs> on the Supreme Court. I love when these people talk about, passionately about things about which they know. Nothing. Here's a little segment. Now listen up! 
Some of you know me as Billy on the street. <laughs> but on September 30th, I have a movie coming out called Bros. Bros is making history as the first gay rom-com ever made by a major studio. And the first where every role is played by an openly LGBTQ actor. Right? And I need you all there in theaters on September 30th because we need to show all the homophobes like Clarence Thomas and all the homophobes on the Supreme Court that we want gay love stories and we support LGBTQ people and we are not letting them drag us back into the last century because they are in the past and bros is the future. Okay, I, mean, I don't recall ever going to a movie saying, well, before I enjoy this movie, I wonder who's gay, who's straight, who's this, who that. I don't care. And by the same token, sometimes fellow people who have a right of center will say, well, Mark, Mark Larson, how can you, you know, uh, how can you have talk with so-and-so? Because don't you know they are this or that, or they are uh, far to the left or whatever. I don't care. They're still interesting. People say, uh, another point, it's, it's a little dated, but it makes a point, like Barbara Streisand. Great talent. Horrible politics. Was it Laura Ingram wrote the book Shut Up and Sing? <laughs> Which is... It's her right as an American to say it. That was controversial. How dare you? It's anti-woman. What's a woman saying that about another woman? There's too, just too, and, and the ignorance on other issues is just amazing. I don't, I, I guess some people, is that what they think? They think that if you are anywhere to the right of center, first of all, you want people to die from COVID. Um, you obviously voted for Trump. You want to go climb the walls in the Capitol and you want to pollute the earth. Have I missed anything on the list? That's what the assumption is. And then you ask them about some common sense things. They have no clue. I'm all for green energy. How are you going to do that? I have a place to plug in. I have sockets. Let's go all electric. By the way, it's getting hot today. Speaking of the power in California with all these edicts. Edicts of plenty and no uh, gas-powered vehicles by 2035 in their fantasy land. San Diego County will experience potentially dangerous heat wave tomorrow through Labor Day. Enjoy. Worst conditions are going to be on Saturday. That's when SD, SDSU will be out at Snapdragon Stadium. Is that real turf or, or uh, artificial turf? I forget. Is it it's artificial? grass. It's grass. Well, that'll help the heat then a little better. Than, um, the National Weather Service has issued an excessive heat watch that will go into effect. This is a lot hotter than the MTV awards. goes into effect tomorrow morning, lasts until at least Sunday, and maybe through Monday when the Padres begin a home stadium uh, uh, homestand at Petco, it's going to be nasty, 110 to 115 in the deserts, going to be up to 105 in places like uh, Valley Center, Escondido, Ramona, Poway, Alpine, Hamul, probably parts of El Cajon, mountains could hit the 90s. Weather service forecaster um, was saying we're going to have very high daytime temperatures, warm nights, so, so it'll be tomorrow midday when the independent system operator says, we're giving it all, you got we can't keep the lights on, you need to flex. Not your muscles, but flex your power. That's where they turn around and say, you know, you need to do this because you are using too much electricity because you don't want to pass out in your own house because you <laughs> want to run your air conditioning and, and be viable and keep mental clarity so you can work and make a living. It's your fault. Buy some other stuff. Same thing with the water crisis. Never let a crisis go to waste. That, that's, that's what you get. Because well, I would say this respectfully to the state bureaucrats, because you won't let us use power that you don't like because you think it's better to be so green and sensitive than, than you are the problem. Can't just keep saying, oh, just, you know, just buy electric cars. Do, it, yeah, do whatever we say. It's great. Works beautifully because we're doing uh, sustainable energy and it's, hey, I'm, I'm all for solar and wind power and whatever, but I'm not for unplugging taking out of the system the stuff that works you realize one of the things in in uh, all things green in in sacramento that what they're saying is if because the system's already overloaded as i pointed out and they're saying we need to have like all electric this or that or cars or san diego 
city retrofitted buildings by 2035. Uh, they say, well, if we have some brownouts, what we'll do in order to keep some of the power on, yeah, we'll keep the Diablo Canyon plant running a few more years. That gives us about 10% of the state's energy. We're not going to use fossil fuels. We'll use the green energy. However, if we need to supplement it to avoid blackouts, we'll allow some construction of more uh, natural gas and and other fuel-burning plants like di diesel generators. So in other words, they're, they're admitting that if we have to in an emergency, we'll use something that works. Meanwhile, go with our schemes. They're great. And you get a flying unicorn. Mike Slater's up next. Larson here. See you tomorrow at 10 on AM 760.